Okay, hi everybody. This is Jonathan. I'm going to talk to you for a few minutes about objectifying. The idea of these little mini lessons is I'm going to talk a little bit about more of the scientific background, like justification for the exercises and things that we'll do together on Tuesday. I wouldn't necessarily share this with any audience, but because we're all academics and we're trying to give you a little bit more of a behind the scenes, help bring your own level of expertise with this stuff up as high as possible. The idea is that we're sharing some of these more backgroundy things. So hopefully this will be interesting. Hopefully it'll take just 10 or 15 minutes. So objectifying. This is just a list of typical microaggressive themes. I don't think I shared this list with you before, but if you've been to various trainings, you may have seen lists of themes like this. And I'm just reminding you that what Dan and I and our colleagues have done in our work is we've essentially made this list of themes smaller in our research, looking at what drives microaggressive likelihood in people who commit microaggressions. And we've essentially identified objectifying as one theme that is really prominent and, in our opinion, really starts the sequence of microaggressing and other biased behavior. And so, so our first meeting will be on objectifying, as we've talked about before. And just to preview the other themes that we identified, which we've also talked about before, are negative attitudes and stereotypes, avoidance, and colorblindness. And so we'll hit all of these in our work, but we're mostly focused on objectifying in this first meeting. So the idea is if you can think about having an interaction with somebody who's different from you, anybody who's different, then we know from psychological science that certain things predictably happen in these interactions. Now, of course, what will happen for you will be individualized. It will depend on your history, your previous exposure, um, just biological variables, just like how quickly your system gets activated and threat and all sorts of individual differences. And so I'm just talking about averages here, which may or may not apply to any particular individual. But on average, in general, we know that when we're interacting with someone who's different from us, the first thing we become aware of, the first thing that happens is that we notice the difference. And we'll call this category activation. Our brain just tries to categorize people. And the first microaggression that we're talking about, which we're calling objectifying, is essentially when our behavior gets hooked by this categorization process. And then we express to the person that we've been hooked in some way. So some typical, classic, objectifying microaggressions that we would label as primarily a category activation issue are when you see this man and you think he looks like Morgan Freeman and you say, hey, anyone ever tell you you look just like Morgan Freeman? This Morgan Freeman thing is an issue for certain black men, I can tell you because I've spoken to several about this. And the thing you have to understand, and that's important to recognize, is we may think this guy looks like Morgan Freeman, but the, in his experience, the only people who ever say, hey, you look just like Morgan Freeman, are white people. In other words, he doesn't get this from black people. It's about getting hooked by his racial features and not really noticing him as an individual. And if you just look at these broad racial features without noticing the individual, then you can say, hey, you look just like Morgan Freeman. In any event, we can talk more about this particular example if you'd like. Some other really classic examples are seeing this Asian woman, I think you're all familiar with this one, and asking her, where are you from? And then when she says, oh, I'm from Issaquah or wherever, you say, no, I mean, where are you really from? Because you've been hooked by her Asian features. And when she says Issaquah, that doesn't satisfy your brain needs to categorize her with something Asian. 
And so then you persist, and that's where the microaggression shows up. The classic, can I touch your hair? You've been hooked by her hair. I had a workshop participant come up to me just last week and say, well, I just think going up to her and saying, can I touch your hair is rude. I mean, why would you do that? It's just a rude thing to do. I don't understand why it's racist. And this was a white man who was saying this to me. And so I asked him, I said, has anyone ever come up to you and asked to touch your hair? And he said, no, never. And I said, me neither. It's not just rude, it's rudeness after you've been hooked by her African style hair, by her racial features. So of course it's rude, but it's rude is the expression, but the underlying process is this racial hooking that happens. You see this woman and you can't figure out the categorization process isn't working. Is she Asian? Is she Latinx? Is she white? I can't figure it out. And so you get hooked and you ask, what are you? So these are just some quick examples of objectifying. I think it'll be fun for us as a group to come up with other examples as well. But for now, I'm going to move on and just give you some of the underlying science. So the first thing that happens when we're interacting with someone who's different from us is we notice the difference. And so this is a research study from Ido and Erland uh, about 17 years ago. That is one of the ones that has been really highly cited on this topic. It shows uh, evoke related potentials. It shows brain responding down to the millisecond when you're looking at a white face versus a black face. These are white participants in this study. And what you can see is just the little blip right here. You're getting a stronger attentional focus to the black face if you're a white person than you are to the white face. You're just noticing the blackness really quickly. You're actually noticing race slightly quicker, even though I don't have a picture of it, than you notice gender. But gender is actually just on the heels of it, a couple milliseconds later. So there's a bunch of studies now that suggest that early attentional processing well before our awareness encodes racial category information in just about 100 milliseconds. It happens super quickly. Again, the first thing that happens when we're interacting across difference is we notice the difference. This is an image of the fusiform face area, fusiform gyrus. The fusiform face area is one of the parts of the brain that helps us individuate faces. It's the part of the brain that lights up when we're really trying to recognize and individuate somebody. And there's now several studies showing that white samples show less fusiform face area activity to black faces versus white faces. In other words, the part of the brain that helps us individuate somebody is not as active for a white person when they're looking at a black face. And so if you put these two things together, you're noticing blackness, but you're not noticing as much of anything else. You're not noticing the individual. And even though this research is about white people and black people, it can be applied much more generally. In general, we do less individuation of out-group faces compared to in-group faces, whoever that out-group and in-group is. So it's not just a white-black thing, but black people will show less fusiform face area activity to white samples and so forth. The third bit of research is on eye contact, and I think this is super important. Another thing that happens when we're first looking at somebody's face is what we attend to differs with respect to eye contact. And so this is research from just last year showing that, again, white people are less likely to make immediate eye contact with black people. They do this with eye tracking software. For a white person, when you're looking at a stereotypically black face, your eyes may make a really quick detour through the person's 
lips the person's nose before making eye contact. In other words, again, you're scanning and noticing the racially distinct features of the person, the stereotypical features of the person, but you're not individuating the person, and most importantly, you're not making as quick and as assured eye contact. And eye contact, as you know, is so important for so many things in terms of recognizing emotion and empathic accuracy and so forth. And even if you're not noticing the difference you're making in eye contact when you're looking at different people, the person on the receiving end probably is. And again, this is research specific to white people and black people, but it's similar whenever we're talking about in-group, out-group differences. So this doesn't just apply to white and black. So if you put all this together, we can start to understand how this objectifying thing happens with this very basic early stuff that's happening in the brain that we're probably not aware of. And we can get hooked and then express itself in this way. This is the cover of a book called How I Shed My Skin by Jim Grimsley. It's a sweet book. I don't know if it's in my top 10 books to recommend to all of you, but it's a sweet book. And he's basically talking about his childhood as a white man growing up in the South and how he essentially shed his racist skin and got over it, essentially. I'm just going to give you a little quote from his writings because I thought it really captured this idea of objectifying really well. So in this quote that I'll read to you in a second, he is talking about traveling with his mother through the black part of the town that he grew up in. And he's commenting how he's literally traveled this part of town hundreds and hundreds of times, and he's never really noticed the people in it. So here's what he wrote. I recognized no one at all and knew nothing of the buildings that I saw. Several black people stood near doorways, worked in yards behind picket fences, fed chickens at the back of their houses, as my mother turned our car onto the road and drove back to the intersection, I knew not one face, though I had driven along that part of the highway dozens of times. The people of Hatchville were invisible to me. Invisible describes that feeling only partly, in fact. In my world, black people were hardly present at all. No part of my brain had been trained to see black faces or to try to know them. No mechanism of recognition or interest was present. I had accepted that black people were different from me and entirely separate from me. This idea of separation had become so complete that in later years I might live in a house in sight of black people who were my neighbors and never see them at all. So we can criticize Jim for being this way, or we can recognize that he's describing fairly normative process in society that undoubtedly has affected all of us to some extent. And again, we could apply this to white people and black people, and I think there's a historical and contemporary reason to do so, but it's also important to apply it across any in-group and out-group. We can apply it across gender, we can apply it across age, we can apply it across all sorts of differences in identity that will matter to us as we have our discussions. So if we go back to this slide, we can try to see how these processes that I just described are common themes underlying these very different examples of microaggressions. It's important to note that as we're talking about category activation and discussing how this can lead to the subjectifying microaggression in and of itself, it's important to note that category activation also starts a process for more complex interactional processes. And threat activation also happens. Attitude and stereotype activation also happens. And we'll talk about how all this comes together to form more complex microaggressions as we go. For now, however, I just want to talk more about objectifying and how we're going to practice these ideas of noticing, noticing, and individuating in response to objectifying. And so when I say noticing, noticing, I mean mindfulness and I mean unhooking. So mindful awareness of subtle activations in your mind and body when interacting with people who are different from you, unhooking from what is activated 
rather than expressing what is activated. And then this idea of individuating and considering identity as complex and nuanced, not just a function of race, and attending to the unique characteristics and qualities of people. So these are the things we're going to work on in practice together with some exercises. A little background. There's actually a lot of research on mindfulness and how mindfulness helps with this exact thing. I didn't quite know the most effective way to convey this research to you, so this slide might not be it, but I just give you the, some, some of the titles of some recent research on the effects of mindfulness on the automaticity of responding and on stereotype activated behaviors and on prejudice and so forth. There's quite a bit of research suggesting that we can do this. And here's just one study. This is a quick study where they simply gave people the implicit attitude test. They gave them a race IAT and an age IAT after either 10 minutes of basic mindfulness meditation or 10 minutes of a control in which they had the same narrator talking about something neutral for 10 minutes. And after just 10 minutes of mindfulness, you can see differences in activations of implicit bias for both race and for age as measured for the IAT. And this effect holds up under a number of different protocols now. Mindfulness seems to really make a difference. So that's why we'll be practicing it together. Okay, so finally, I will talk for just a minute or two about this idea of individuating and, in particular, considering identity as complex and nuanced, not just a function of race, and attending to the unique characteristics and qualities of people. This is one way of looking at this issue of identity. It's a bit of a simplification, but hopefully it's a useful simplification. And in this model, we have three levels of identity. And so it starts with the universal level. And so the idea of the universal level is these are things that we all have in common as human beings. It, other levels of identity don't really matter here. We're all human beings. We all have basic needs, although there are differences with respect to how much those basic, basic needs are met. We all have the capacity for feelings as homo sapiens, as humans. We all manipulate symbols and logic to some degree. These are things that define us. We all have some amount of self-awareness. My cat is meowing, I apologize. And we all have self-efficacy or at least a yearning for self-efficacy. And so this universal level is important and it's also a level where people can get caught. This is where colorblindness shows up. When people are up here at this universal level all the time, rather than recognizing the importance of the group level of race and racism, which is the next level. So we all also have a group level. And here are some dimensions upon which we vary at the group level. And then, of course, we all have an individual level where we are relatively unique from each other. And what I want to say here is that we can get into trouble if we stay at the universal level and recognizing the group level, recognizing identity and how identity plays into dynamics of power and oppression in our country and our world is extremely important. But for this moment, when we're talking about objectifying, I actually want to lean in to the individual level. Because when we're talking about getting hooked by somebody's racial features and individuating, it's partially about disconnecting from our social constructs of race that hook us and instead really seeing the individual. So, for example, in my case, in terms of race and gender, I'm a white man. And when we're doing an analysis of dynamics of power and oppression, then it's really important for me to recognize how I experience a lot of privilege and power at that level and to work to really understand that deeply and to have that understanding conveyed in my actions. However, when we're talking about objectifying, 
I want you all to know that my identity, how I experience myself, how we all experience ourselves, is much deeper and more complex than just race or just gender. So for example, I'm a white man, but I'm also an Ashkenazi Jew. And uh, my family's from Poland, and I identify with that. But ethnically, culturally, I feel a real kinship with Brooklyn, New York. And at the individual level, I am 52 years old. I have an older sister. I have a small family. My mother was an alcoholic. I have a 15-year-old daughter. All this is really important to my identity. So as we talk about individuating, we're wanting to disconnect from just these basic social constructs of race and gender that we're taught that aren't accurate and really lean into a wonderfully complex and nuanced sense of individual identity and get curious about it when we're looking at people. So that's it. There's much more to say about that. I'll leave you with a teaser for what we'll do on Tuesday, perhaps if we have time. These are six pictures of people who strongly identify as black. And as you look at their faces, you'll see how different they are. All different shades from white passing to light brown to darker skinned. But these are people who strongly identify as black. In fact, they each are the direct descendants of very famous slaves in our country. So just take a look at these five women and one man for a moment. And we'll play with this more. This is just a teaser for what we'll do together on Tuesday. And so with this teaser, I'm going to end now and we'll talk more. Okay, bye.